What's up, everyone? Welcome to a Tidal Gardens Coral Spotlight. If you're new to this channel, Tidal Gardens is a coral farm located in Copley, Ohio, and here we talk about all things coral reef related. This video is all about Samacora. Samacora are an uncommon stony coral in the aquarium trade. They're infrequently imported compared to other corals and typically fly under the radar of most hobbyists. I don't typically see a lot of reef keepers go out of their way to track down this genus of corals. That's not to say that they're not abundant in the wild. Samacora are found throughout the reefs in the Indo-Pacific. That includes Fiji, Tonga, Solomon Islands, and Great Barrier Reef in Australia. It's an oddball coral in the sense that most reef hobbyists, even those that are enthusiastic about SPS tanks, are unfamiliar with it. Its appearance in many ways resembles other encrusting small polyp stony corals such as Montipora, Leptastria, Pavona, or even Leptoceras. When they grow out, the coral encrusts over the surface of the rock and can make for a bright and beautiful landscape. Some varieties can form branches, but most of them are encrusting. There are structural variations from species to species within Samacora, so it's understandable for hobbyists and vendors to misidentify this coral. I'm sure we've done it. There's a surprising number of color morphs that Samacora expresses. In the past, there were only green ones that I was aware of, but over time, our collection of color morphs increased to the point that right now, it's one of our most diverse SPS corals that we're currently culturing. It'll be interesting to see if there's more color morphs that'll pop up in the future. Now that we've covered some background on the coral, let's talk more specifically about the care requirements for Samacora, starting with lighting. When it comes to lighting and placement in the tank, Samacora are pretty flexible. We've kept Samacora in different lighting intensities However, we favor keeping them in aquariums with medium to high light. What is medium to high light? It's anything around 100 to 200 par. It's a good starting point. Samacora have consistent coloration, meaning they won't completely shift color palette in the way Acropora or Montipora will. But that's not to say that better lighting won't bring out more desirable coloration. In my tanks at least, they seem to have brighter colors and better highlights when provided more intense lighting than, say, in a dimmer aquarium under 50 par. One thing to always consider is to not fry corals under too much light too quickly. Even if you plan to keep it under 200 plus par lighting, it's always a good idea to acclimate it slowly to those intensities. Lighting that is too intense will kill off a coral much faster than lighting that's too dim. So when in doubt, go with dimmer light and slowly move the coral into higher light. If you start to see Samacora bleaching out, the most likely cause is high lighting intensity and I would recommend relocating the coral immediately or turning down the light if you can. Let's move on to water flow for this coral. Samacora appreciate medium to high flow. Water movement serves two main functions for corals. The first is that it carries away waste and helps prevent detritus from settling onto the coral. The second function that strong water flow provides is transporting nutrients to the coral. As a practical tip, pay attention to the water flow in the tank over time. Corals like consistency, and Samacora is no different in that regard. Unfortunately, water flow is one of those things that tends to be inconsistent as a tank ages. Coral growth, especially with fast growing species, reduces the flow in the tank. Also, organisms like to grow around aquarium pumps and plumbing, which will reduce flow. Some pumps in particular are really sensitive to any obstruction, so it's best to routinely clean them out when possible. Samacora have small polyps and you would not expect to see dramatic feeding displays, but they're surprisingly good at eating. 
I say surprising because your polyps are very small, and much of the time, corals with very small polyps tend to shy away from direct feeding. Samacora, though, can grab onto small pieces of food and quickly consume them. Now, I wouldn't really go out of my way to spot feed them, but they're more than capable of eating small pieces of mysis shrimp if given the opportunity. Going back to our talk of water flow, some hobbyists like to turn off the pumps to feed the corals to give them more of an opportunity to grab food, because if the flow is too strong, it usually just blows right past them. Having said that, even in strong currents, these corals are likely taking in other forms of nutrients in the water, such as amino acids. I did a video all about amino acids, so if you want to learn more about them, be sure to check out that video. But to summarize, amino acids are small organic compounds that play a major role in building proteins as well as in other biological functions at the cellular level in the corals. Corals regularly take in available amino acids from the water column, so it's easy to provide them with adequate quantities by broadcast feeding an amino acid solution. There have been some studies that suggest that water flow increases the efficiency at which the corals take in amino acids. So, it's possible that what the coral lacks in prey capture, they can make up for in increased amino acid uptake when provided stronger flow. Let's talk briefly about chemistry. I'll break it up into two sections, growth parameters and pollution parameters. Starting with growth parameters, because Samacora are stony corals, there are three major chemical parameters that are needed to power that skeletal growth. These are calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. Real quick, calcium is a major ion in salt water. In the ocean, the level hovers right around 425 parts per million. As a coral grows, calcium is absorbed from the water and used to form that calcium component in calcium carbonate. Alkalinity, on the other hand, it's not a particular ion, but rather a general figure of carbonate availability in the water. There are over, I don't know, a dozen different ions constantly interacting with one another that make up alkalinity. Technically, it is the amount of acid required to lower the pH of salt water to the point that bicarbonate turns into carbonic acid. So if you have more alkalinity, it can soak up more acid. If you have less alkalinity, you have less buffering capacity, making the tank more susceptible to chemical changes. This is why in practice, alkalinity tends to be the parameter that fluctuates the most. There are a lot of different ions at play that could potentially be thrown off of balance, and that results in a dip in overall alkalinity. In the wild, the alkalinity of the water settles right around 8 to 9 dKH, so try to keep it steady in that ballpark. Remember, consistent levels is much more important than chasing a specific number. Even if your levels are low, I would be more inclined just to keep it right there at those low levels if the corals are doing okay. Now, if you decide to elevate those levels to more closely match natural seawater, I recommend doing so slowly over a long period of time. That brings me to my next point. Raising both calcium and alkalinity together can be tricky because of how they interact. Calcium ions and carbonate want to react with one another. Adding calcium supplements often comes with a corresponding fall in alkalinity levels, and vice versa. If you're experiencing this in your systems, it's normal, but you really want to avoid major swings, right? If you're experiencing wild swings of calcium and alkalinity every time you use an additive, you may want to look at your magnesium levels. Magnesium behaves chemically similar to calcium. It can bind up carbonate ions, and that increases the overall bioavailability of alkalinity in the water. If you're tweaking calcium and alkalinity and getting strange results, you may want to make sure it's not your magnesium levels that are messed up. In the ocean, magnesium sits at around 1350 parts per million and tends to be the most stable of those three parameters that we just talked about. Moving on to the pollution parameters, we have nitrate and phosphate. 
These two parameters are the measurements of water cleanliness that are most commonly done by hobbyists. We recommend shooting for about 10 to 15 parts per million nitrate and 0.05 parts per million phosphate. In practice here, we keep both levels considerably higher. Now, if nitrate levels get too high, corals may react negatively by taking on like either drab coloration or even dying back entirely. If phosphate levels are too high, it may feed an unwanted algae bloom. But these are very general figures. Corals tend to be very adaptable, so your mileage may vary. For example, we keep our nitrate closer to 50 parts per million, I'd say 25 to 50, and our phosphate has gone up to two parts per million before, and we haven't had issues with algae. But again, we're talking about ideal numbers, so sticking to 10 to 15 nitrate, 0.05 phosphate, you should have some success. Now, there can be trouble if these parameters are too low. Some people keep their systems insanely clean, and that may lead to other problems because corals do need to have some present for nutrition. Nitrate and phosphate are compounds that they can't get through photosynthesis alone. And if they don't have enough, they take on this shrunken, emaciated look and oftentimes will start to die back. Okay, so that should give you guys a little bit of a background on the chemical parameters to keep an eye on for these corals. Let's move on to the topic of aggression. Samacora isn't really any more or less aggressive than any other SPS coral. If it touches another coral, it's going to fight. So I always recommend giving it plenty of space to grow and keep an eye on it to make sure that it doesn't grow and either touch another coral or get dislodged and fall into something. Okay, that pretty much does it for Samacora. So who is Samacora best suited for? I see it as an SPS coral for someone that's just looking for something different. It's an uncommon coral and a nice change of pace from that sea of fuzzy sticks in an SPS dominated reef. So what do you think? Is Samacora something that you'd be interested in for your home aquarium? Anyway, that does it from here. Hopefully this video is helpful for those looking to try them for the first time. If you would like more information or perhaps purchase Samacora for your home aquarium, I invite you to visit us at tidalgardens.com and see what we have in stock. We're always on the lookout for new and interesting color morphs of this coral to add to our collection. Alright guys, till next time, happy reefing.